and I will um, maybe occasionally pop back in just so you can make some face to face contact. Remember the human being here. Um, I think that it could get a little chaotic if, 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 if we do somehow manage to get to 40 people, but even just as many people as we have now, if we are all um, chiming in, it can get a little chaotic. So what we're going to do is I'm going to keep that chat window open and uh, Lori and Joe are going to keep an eye on the chat for me too so that we make sure to catch all your questions and any, anything you want to do. So feel free to interrupt at any point and ask any questions you like, but use that chat function. And if you're not seeing it, scroll around the bottom there, you should see a little chat or depending on what window you're in, you might see like a little more button and then find the chat option. So go ahead and mute your microphone, and, uh, but, but we, we love to see your pretty face so you can leave the, the, the video up. But um, let's try to use chat, and now I'm gonna go find my presentation and- And while you're doing that, Gordon, may I introduce you? <laughs> well, Lori, that'd be wonderful, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So Gordon Wright works at Education Post, and he is, his thing is social media, and he's going to also lead us in a webinar in June about once we've written a good blog, how to really get it out there and use uh, Facebook and Twitter and other social media appropriately. But he is a real friend to teachers and teacher voice, and he is one of the people who edits our blogs when we send them to him to see if he has any interest. So um, he was just sharing so many things with me that I thought, gosh, I thought I knew how to blog and I learned a lot just talking with him. So I wanted to um, invite him in. And so well, we are just so glad to have you. And so again, if everybody will mute except for Gordon and I'm going to mute too, uh, feel free to chat and feel free to um, reach out to me in the chat screen also if you need anything. Thank you so much, Lori. Yeah. Um, and she's absolutely right that, um, one of my, you know, one of our, our main things we want to do at, at Education Post is try to help elevate the voices of, of, of teachers. And uh, in part of that is, is blogging is just a great way to do that. So um, let's see here. Um, this is just a quick slide about Education Post because some of you may not have heard of us. We're um, mostly known for our blog at educationpost.org. Um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan. We're fully funded by some foundations with basically just the goal of go out and help people um, communicate about education reform. And so we, we do that in a number of ways. Um, on our blog, we do it. We have a lot of local blogs too. We work with individual bloggers, um, even some, some toys that we've worked with. We're just kind of literally set them up on a WordPress site, tell them how to do it. Um, maybe, maybe help them with the hosting or help them get some ideas and things like that. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, let's talk. Um, and then the private facing side of the work, which is really more than just um, kind of communication support. A lot of educational justice nonprofits and groups that work with, with teachers and work with, with students and parents. To help them. And, and some of my colleagues even spend time practically embedded in districts, you know, where districts were, that are really struggling to turn things around or to, to make great strides. Um, it's hard to communicate about that stuff. And as you all know, as teachers, districts aren't always the best uh, at doing that. And so we try to help them as much as possible and, um, and being honest and transparent with the, what they're doing and, and really engaging the stakeholders like teachers. And um, that's what we're about. Um, so let's just start getting on the same page about what is blogging um, because sometimes there is a little confusion there. Um, so I went just straight to Google because it's got the uh, least controversial definition. And it actually just says a blog is a regularly updated website or web page that's written in an informal or conversational style. So I love that it adds that informal conversational. I think we all, those of us who kind of spend a lot of time trolling around the internet, we do kind of see that um, it feels different than um, what we call traditional media. Um, there's, there, you feel like there's a person on the other end of it. You feel a little like you're having a conversation with them. And I think that that's really, that's meaningful um, when you're thinking about writing blogs. Um, and uh, the other aspect of it is that it is regularly updated. So that's important to point out. This is the, the blog is actually the whole, the whole platform, the whole website. Um, so just to get, so to minimize confusion, I recommend that you, that you remember that the piece of content itself is called a post or an entry. 
And um, so sometimes people be like, I wrote a blog for my blog. I'm blogging a blog for my blog. It starts to get a little confusing. So um, sometimes it's, it's important to kind of distinguish that your blog might be the website you have set up. And then the post is each little individual entry that you're writing um, on your blog. Um, it, it's also a verb, like I was saying, you know, and so, you know, it'd be important for you to, to mention to people that you're blogging about uh, going to the conference, you're blogging about uh, in being in your classroom. Um, so, so that's also correct usage. Um, all right, so a big question that we get a lot of times is how long is this supposed to be? Um, obviously, if you read blogs, you realize there's no hard and fast rule. I mean, people can, can do what they want. But generally, there seems to be a best practice that's emerged. It's around the 400 to 600 word range. Um, that's not as long as, say, like an op-ed in a, a newspaper can be longer than that. Sometimes those go like 700 to 900 words. Um, uh, on the internet, we don't have quite that much of an attention span. So generally, we're going to keep it down to 400 to 600 words. Really just make one solid point. Um, now, it can be longer if you've got a really good narrative. And those are, of course, some of the blogs, that, blog posts that are the most viral are the ones that are really compelling, um, where um, somebody just tells a humdinger of a story and they've, you know, or they really have a lot to unpack. Um, if you've got it, if you've got that kind of stride, then that's great. You can, you can make your post longer. Uh, but it, usually it just, if, you're, if your post is getting over a thousand words, you've probably just gone on too long. Um, and then it can be shorter. Um, you know, if you've got your own personal blog, we do what we sometimes call, in, in education posts, we call blurbing where you're just really kind of saying, hey, you know what? So-and-so wrote a blog post over at this other site, and it's great, and here's a quote from it. Um, those could just be a couple hundred words. Um, that still counts as a blog post, um, but it's a different kind of thing, and it, it's great for when you're doing your own personal blog. And then even shorter than that, um, there's actually kind of a phenomenon called microblogging, and this can get into kind of arcane territory, so I won't, I won't delve into this too much. But this is just the idea that the re, the, the, where things like Tumblr and Twitter and stuff came from was that all these guys who had kind of invented the blog and were working on blogs um, actually uh, wanted something that was shorter and quicker, and they wanted it to be... Uh, a little easier to, to, to jump in and jump out. And that's kind of where all the social media tools we see emerged from. All right. So if you have any questions about all that, feel free to type them in the chat. But otherwise, I'm going to go uh, on to the, uh, the do's and don'ts for writing blog posts. And I want to start with five tips that we found at Education Posts are pretty critical. Um, one, stay on topic. Two, tell your story. Three, know your audience. Four, and tell them why. Obviously, that means you tell them why they should care. And number five, be opinionated. Now, I'm going to unpack those. Don't worry. I'm not I'm just going to move on from that. Um, let's start with staying on topic. Um, this is something, uh, it, it can be tough, you know, if you sit down and you write something sort of stream of consciousness, that can be actually a great way to get your ideas on paper. So I'm not discouraging you from doing that. But the trick is once you're finishing it up, you've got to make sure that your blog post really just has one big idea and it sticks with it from beginning to end. Um, you want to <laughs> edit it ruthlessly. Um, there's something in the uh, newspaper business, they call it the throat clearing that happens when you know, you've got um, several paragraphs at the beginning where you're kind of, you know, kind of setting the table and sort of like uh, naming all these things before you even really get to what's the, what's this blog post going to be about. So don't do that. Um, that's a don't, don't clear your throat. Um, and then using a strong headline, um, it's actually really great. Um, we're going to get into headlines a little more now. Um, but the, the gist of it is with a blog post, if you can really, uh, kind of sum up what it is your what your, uh, your the topic of your blog post and write that down in just a very straightforward headline and write that at the top of your page it can be a great anchor for you as you're writing kind of look up and be like wait am I still talking about that does that still describe what I'm doing here um, so it can be sort of a north star um, 
this is a little section here. Now I'm going to talk about headlines. Um, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll use some newspaper jargon throughout this because I now at Education Post, I have a digital and social media background, as Lori said. But at Education Post, I work with a bunch of former journalists. So and I'm learning all these, these hip journalist terms. And I find that they're really useful for some of this stuff. So I, what I realized was that headlines are the new lead. Um, there used to be a time where um, the headline kind of didn't matter. It could be whatever it was. And then the lead was the big uh, opening sentence that really just named all the facts and everything that mattered. And um, that was, you know, what what... Uh, that told you whether or not you wanted to read the rest of the piece. Um, now headlines are that in social media and on blogs. That's, that's what headlines serve the purpose of. And that makes sense. You think about it most of the time when you're encountering a, a blog post, you're first seeing just a headline, whether it's on Twitter or on Facebook or somebody just emailed you a link and you can read the URL and you can see like what the headline's going to be. Um, that's when you're making your judgment call. Does that sound like something I want to read? So you want to make sure that the headline does what a good lead should do, which is you want to give the re reader all the details about what's going on, but you also want to create some interest so that they want to read further. Um, and I mentioned here at the bottom of the slide that headlines do often serve as the tweet because on most blogs, there's going to be a little share button of a little blue bird that when you click on it, it's going to populate a tweet for you. Well, generally what it does is it just grabs the headline. So if your headline is something that doesn't necessarily describe the piece, it's not going to be a very effective tweet either. So it really has a huge amount to do with what kind of amplification and circulation your post is going to get, getting that good headline. Um, Gordon, I there's someone wrote a question about, um, is, is there a length for headlines? Um, and are you trying to put words in there that are searchable? Um, can you put too many searchable words so it's wonky? So those are sort of two separate questions. Yeah, I and mean, sorry, I'm not seeing that in the chat, but- um, Well, one of them is in the chat, and one is one that someone asked me about. Oh, I got oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, privately, they privately chat. Yeah, yeah, I got you, got you. Yeah. I just wanna make sure I wasn't misusing yeah. no. the if I'm, I'm, we're all together. Um, so the, the, the first part of that was, was how long? Is that what you said? Or Yes, how long? Is there a length guideline for a headline? Um, so and the thing is, I think that they can be longer than you think. I want to walk you through this exercise and show you that um, one example that we use at Education Post is we got a great post about Montessori. And um, it... The, the title on it was play is the work of the child when well, anybody who knows Montessori knows that that's that that's a that's a cool title and, and like if you were reading a magazine article or a newspaper article that title might work fine um, because in that format you're already looking at the beginning of the piece you can read the lead and see if you're interested in the piece um, but in the world of social media that title is just not it doesn't tell you anything about what's going to happen and people won't click on it so we augmented it to be something a little deeper um, so first of all, you're going to see that it's long. It's a pretty long headline. Um, second of all, you're going to see that, um, I think you mentioned, Laurie, in, in one of those questions about keywords. Um, that's exactly why we tried to, you know, it, when you talk about keywords, people always think of like Google, right? And that does matter. I mean, we can have a conversation about search engines and optimizing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but really what Google's trying to do is be like a person. And so we use keywords just as much as Google. And so when you see how Maria Montessori can help us get past the false debate between work and play, you're, these, are the, these are key words that are meaningful for readers. And so by do, by with, once we switched it to this title, this post actually took off for us. We got a whole bunch of people coming through um, you know, in, from an early childhood sort of world who obviously cared about Maria Montessori. Uh, we got a whole bunch of people coming in um, who are engaged in like the common core debates around, you know, whatever. So the idea is, uh, you know, work uh, about um, play. So I think the idea was, let's make sure that the, that the piece, you know, sounds first of all, interesting how, you know, I want to know how that's interesting. I mean, it sounds a little Buzzfeed like, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it, that, that kind of works. And um, 
it, 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 it tells you enough though that you, you feel like you're gonna get there. One more thing I wanted to point out though about headlines is don't make false promises. And so sometimes you get hug, you get like, I've got this great headline. And then you actually realize your piece never really answers that question or never really fully, you know, and that actually over time that breeds a, the, a bad um, juju. People aren't going to follow you after a while because they'd feel like you're kind of shallow. Um, let me show one more and then we'll make sure that we got the question answered. Um, this was one that came in. It was a great piece from a teacher that um, was about her, her kind of dealing with, um, her own biases and trying to deal with that. And this just, this, this title just didn't, didn't convey it. And the other thing is that when people see the headline, they don't necessarily know that this is a teacher who wrote this, you know, I mean, is this going to be a piece that's, you know, taking on a teacher or condemning teachers, or is this a piece that's by a teacher, you know? So we changed it to be, you know, I had to admit my own racial prejudice to become a better teacher. But now, you know, just from the headline that this is a teacher who wrote it. I think that's really critical is that, you know, you want your standing and your sort of personal engagement to come to, to you want to lead with that. So I think that's an example of something where, again, it, this one really took off for us, got a lot of traction. And, um, and I think part of that, you know, is getting the right headline on it so that people actually go in. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Nick, for loving this topic. Is the topic that you love headlines or is the topic you love, um, uh, prejudice urban educators i'm not sure but um the uh laurie was there other um did i did i unpack that whole question oh, um, so the other question that came in privately was about um keywords which you mentioned some of the keywords but part of that was can you is there a danger of using so many keywords that you sound jargony Yes, definitely. And then I think that's, that gets back to the point of really be thinking about your readers and think about yourself, you know, and where you consume this content um, is, I think, um, I, I think that's a, that's a helpful indicator um, of, you know, rather than thinking about, oh, I got to pack in the keyword so Google will like my title. Um, think about what would get you to click on that piece. I think that's going to be a much better indicator. So let's move on to number two, um, which is uh, to tell your story. Um, and this is, you know, it seems self-evident, but I mean, you'd be surprised how many, particularly from teachers, we get a lot of submissions where um, they kind of explain policy and they kind of talk in generalities about um, sort of like, students do this, students do that and whatever. And it's just so much more compelling when you can tell an anecdote. And you know, if you have to change the first name of somebody, that's fine. It's, I don't think people really care about that kind of veracity. I think the point is to tell honest stories about what's going on. Um, those stories that go on in the classroom, guys, they're just, they're so, so rich. And I can tell you as someone who is not in the classroom, um, that that stuff just you never tire of hearing these stories of like what, what it's like to be in that, that, that kind of experience with students. Um, I know that all of you carry just years of fascinating and compelling and, you know, heartfelt, hysterical and depressing stories of all kinds. Um, those are just, you know, there's so many blog posts within that. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to point out was to, uh, in the bottom of the do column there to humanize yourself with vivid details. And I don't know if I express this right, but I often think of it as like, you, you gotta make it, if you just use something kind of, if you just rely on the stereotypes that people are used to, you're not gonna really create an evocative picture for people. Um, it's when you kind of combine some un unique details about a child or a colleague or yourself um, in your own, in your own background, that's when, um, it creates a really memorable picture for people and they're just drawn into it. So that's another aspect of telling your story. It's so essential. Um, uh, Gordon, I went, in the very beginning when you were talking about um, length, you were giving a word recommendation, but you said, unless you have a strong narrative. And by narrative, do you mean literally strong story? Um, yes. Yeah, actually, that's what I mean. I just mean like, it's comp it, it just keeps going. I think the way to think about it, when I mentioned that narrative, I was talking earlier in the, in the presentation about this idea 
that you um, that you shouldn't think about the word count. You should think about you know kind of if you've got if you got if your story's still going, then you keep going. Um, but it's that idea that somebody has to keep scrolling and keep scrolling. And if if you if you if you know if you, if you're keeping them scrolling and the story is really unfolding, then it can be. Don't worry about your length. Um, but I think that's that's a rare sort of blog post. That's a specific kind of thing where you're telling, you know, or you're maybe writing what they call a long read. Um, and so that that's something that um, that's something I, I think uh, the focus on. Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Things are getting heated over here. Um, and uh, I, you know what, Michael, I'm gonna I'm gonna park that question for a little bit because I think that's a really good one. And um, and I want to I want to dig into that further. Um, it, it well, maybe we could do it now. I guess it relates to this idea of the, um, you know, how do you, um, you know, no, let's park it at the end because I think I think it's going to generate a lot of really good um, conversation here with the group. So, um, so so Joe, help me remember that that, that he asked that. I don't want to I don't want to lose that later. Um, so I'm going to move on to, 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 to number three which is knowing your audience. Uh, this is just really critical, guys. And I um, really want to emphasize that um, you, you need to, you know, just, just think of it empathically. Like you got to just step into the shoes of a reader and really realize what they are going to, how they're going to perceive what you're writing. Um, and I think the reason I mentioned this is because so often it's very hard, particularly when, you're in a world, you know, you're, when you're teaching, for instance, you're in a world that has so many different, uh, you know, kind of specific environments that people just don't know what it's like. Um, and that makes it very difficult, I think, sometimes for teachers to describe all the stuff that you need to understand before they can really tell the story. Um, so really try to, to, to artfully kind of convey that context i think that's really um it can really be meaningful um readers are, are so fascinated to learn what it's like to be in the classroom um, and what it's like to have the teacher's vantage point um and so often i think it's unfortunate when when teachers end up losing their audience because either they kind of make assumptions about sort of like well you know we are doing this and doing that and kind of making assumptions about like people understand how passing periods work and, you know, or how, how a particular, you know, evaluation from the principal would work without explaining sort of what the context is for that. Um, and then of course, jargon is just, uh, that's a curse for, for anybody uh, who's in a profession. It's very hard to step, talk to people. Uh, and this is not limited to teachers. It's hard for anybody to talk to people about their work because necessarily jargon's part of it. But that's critical. The, the blog post is a really important time to do that. And then I think that really leads to the last point of aiming at a broader audience. Um, you know, there's this idea that, you know, people think, well, I don't really need to de-jargon mine because most of this is for other teachers and things like that. Um, but in fact, you're going to find that even other teachers are necessarily using the same jargon or understanding things the same way that you are. Um, and more importantly, there's others kind of in the room, as it were. You know, others are going to encounter this blog post and the chance for it to, to move beyond a small limited bubble and get out there and, to, and you know, and really get it out there. I won't say viral, but definitely spread is, um, is, is, is all about being able to create a larger context for your piece. Um, um, oh, and one person asked, um, sorry, what, um, Gordon, so yeah. what he asked about, um, I can see her question actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say that, um, yeah, there, this is, you know, I use the word artful to describe how you should give context. It is kind of annoying to be like, okay, now let me explain what, you know, Common Core is so that I can now talk about it again. Um, I think, uh, but that said, I think that there is need, there's a, there's, there's a way to sort of just, you know, you don't need them to know everything, right? You don't need them to deeply understand the policy for something or other at your school. 
but you do need to just kind of provide that extra clause in your sentence that sort of says, this is what I'm talking about, or this is why that has stakes for me or something like that. Um, so, and Bill makes a good point that, you know, hyperlinks can give background knowledge, but I think even with the hyperlinks, like that actually is great. You know, if you've got say another post you wrote where you really went deep on something and you want to build off that, a hyperlink is definitely the, the, the way to do it. Um, but even then, I think you want to provide as much context as you can in the post um, without overwhelming. So I think it's just finding a balance, honestly. Um, and then I think, you know, somebody asked about, um, is there jargon that I particularly think people should avoid? Um, I mean, God, I'm not even the right one to ask. I'm, so, I'm swimming in jargon myself these days. But I think particularly things like, um, you know, um, if you're gonna talk about, say, the park test, um, if you live in a district where, or a state where they're administering park, it starts to become a household word and almost everybody knows about it. Um, and it's important to remember that if you're writing, particularly in the platform that many of you guys are as toys, you're actually kind of um, writing to a more, a more national audience sometimes, even if you're not intending to. Um, it's important just to remember, you know, that that's, that it's, uh, you know, this is the standardized test that, that our, my whole state takes or something like that. So you want to kind of, simplify it down to just you know what is it what you're explaining it to your aunt who does nothing about your work you know um sometimes a helpful audience to think about i think for for you guys might be parents and imagine that that parent comes in who who is obviously they're devoted to their child but they are really not paying attention at all to the work you're, you're sending home or the um or the stuff that's going on in the school and the district, and you're trying to talk in a way that they can understand. I think that that can be very, you know, when you're reaching for a bigger audience, that, that kind of mindset is helpful. Um, yeah, and I pretty much just avoid acronyms as much as possible. Um, you know, obviously you gotta use them now and then, but um, it's, I, I try to come up with ways not to use, just not to use, you know, what's a good example i don't know like um like sometimes um in our work we talk about charter schools a lot and the um people will sometimes never say the phrase charter school they'll simply write a post where they always call them charters and i think that that's the kind of thing where um if if you're somebody who's not immersed in that world you're um you even though you might know what it means, it's a little bit exclusive to kind of jump right into the way you talk to your colleagues. Um, so that's the kind of thing where while I'll add the word school, at least in some of the instances to kind of give it some uh, more accessibility. So the, my point number four was tell them why. And this is so critical because I think that um, you've got to explain why your topic matters to them. Um, I think so often when we write something, and now this is not something limited at all to teachers, by the way, this is something that so many of the posts that come in uh, to education posts are from you know, people who work in education. They've, they've dedicated their lives to these issues. So when they write a post, it's a kind of explaining something. It's like it doesn't even occur to them that somebody might need to know why. Um, so that's something that I've been, um, and really encouraging our writers to do more of. Now, this gets back to an earlier question, you know, like, well, geez, do I have to like explain everything to people? And no, I mean, if you know your audience and you know what they, if you know what they, they need, then you may not need to, to go right back and, and start from some, from ground zero and build your case. Um, but I do think that you always need um, something to anchor your piece and why this opinion you're sharing is, is, uh, is relevant to what's going on. Um, so one phrase of, um, a friend of ours used, uh, one of our bloggers used was fact bomb. And I loved that because I think what we found particularly is that data, just a little data, don't, don't go crazy with data. Um, that's very hard to, to make a work in a blog post. But a couple of facts, uh, or even just one, that really gets somebody to raise their eyebrows and really gets them to, to think, uh, that can be really impactful um, and really, it, it really pulls together the piece. Um, 
and and then it it makes your opinions and your anecdotes suddenly seem um, really salient as opposed to just kind of you rambling on. Um, so I also say include a nut graph. This is another fun term that the newspaper folks in my in my office like to use, and um, it it now I, I see its its real importance. So I actually made a slide for it. Um, so what is a nut graph? Um, assuming some of you on here aren't journalism teachers and won't know this phrase. Um, so the nut graph um, comes from nutshell paragraph. So basically this is that paragraph that in like a feature story in a newspaper, it's maybe the third or fourth paragraph where, you know, the, the piece is starting with something that's saying like, you know, oh, you know, Mary had, uh, uh, you know, uh, such a long commute. It took her two hours to get her, her child to school and look at, you know, all this difficult stuff she's doing. And then the nut graph would say something like, you know, Mary is one of hundreds of thousands of parents who do this, whatever. And, you know, and then there'll be some statistic or some sort of blanket statement that sort of zooms out and establishes why this is a, there's a, there's a big trend here that you should care about. Um, it turns out this is really relevant for blog posts that like with blog posts, you know, they're very much about you stating an opinion and a point of view and sharing your own personal story. But so often they'll miss that zooming out moment where it says like, and this matters for everybody. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be that third paragraph I and mean, you don't have to follow the newspaper um, formula exactly. But I think usually if you do it a little earlier, it can be a little stronger. Um, and then I mentioned again, this fact bomb. Sometimes this can include the fact bomb. It doesn't always have to be data, but um, I think that, the the idea of finding that little piece of data is is a really good one for you guys because I was talking to Joe um, before the uh, webinar started and he was pointing out that it's it's often hard um, you know you might have all these anecdotes stored up but it's hard to come up with exactly what the real topic of your blog post is going to be and I think um, one of the best sources for this is just keeping an eye on sort of the stories that are emerging uh, in the news and reports that are coming out. And you'll see a statistic or something that just grabs your, your attention and just pulls you to attention and you think, wow, that's, that's really high or that can't be right or whatever it is that makes you think. And then that can be a great launching off point for a blog post. And then with that launching off point, you, you of course pull in, these personal stories that you have and your own personal history. And that's how you flesh it out and make it something readable and engaging. But it's uh, a lot of times that's the thing that sort of anchors the whole point. My last point then is I kind of alluded to this all along, but it is number five is be opinionated. Um, you look, if you're writing a blog post, it, it, it means you have something to say. And so there is, there's a level where you got to, you, you, um, some of you out there might be uh, extremely opinionated and this won't be a problem, but some of us are actually, we see ourselves as very reasonable, very sort of middle of the road. And, and sometimes if, if you write a blog post that really just kind of says nothing because you don't want to actually make advocate for something, um, it just ends up being kind of boring. Um, so we've had a lot of those submitted that are very thoughtful, but it just kind of leaves you sort of like, Oh, all right. Um, those are not ones that are going to get traction. Um, and so for those of you who are sort of less, you know, quote unquote, opinionated, I think the trick is to find where you do have a strong point of view. And of course, somewhere in there you do. And that's where you really, um, you want to really hit your, your, your point of view and stick with it. And so that's why I said, kind of say at the, at the bottom there, you want to state your point of view at the beginning and then restate it at the end. And this kind of gets back to that idea that if you wrote a headline of that piece, it would be consistent throughout. It would be like you started, I, I'm, I think that this is true. And then you make your case and at the end, again, I think this is true. That, that's, that's kind of how the blog post works. And so um, I, I put in there too, to be reasonable, do reflect on both sides of the argument. Now it doesn't really work if you actually just kind of um, are, are so one-sided and uh, people just assume that you're, you know, a zealot. Um, so I wanted to share with you an example of based on that opinionated um, suggestion. And, um, and this is uh, one of your colleagues named James Ford, um, who uh, is, he's worked with us for a little while and 
we only discovered and we just read an article he wrote in 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 charlotte where he lives and we were like wow this guy's amazing and he was a former teacher and we should get him to write for us and so we just we approached him and said hey would you be willing to write a blog post for us and it turns out of course he's involved with you guys and he's writing for a lot of folks and um and it's been a pleasure to work with him so what i'm going to do is actually um i'm going to try to chat in the the link to his post uh, this is his first post he did for us a couple months ago on our site and um and we won't take a ton of time to read it here, but um, if you want to click over to your browser and just kind of skim a little bit, I'll give you a couple minutes. So one thing I want to point out as you're, you're reading this is just that um, you notice at the top, you know, he's got a ton of shares. He's got um, a nearly 700 Facebook shares. That's very high for our, our website. Um, the, uh, and, and even 50 LinkedIn shares. And you know, we never, sometimes <laughs> things, but we don't usually get those, but you know, in some cases we do. Um, James got a big network there of the people. And I think one of the things that um, I wanted to point out was uh, in, in fact, uh, Joe made a good point to me um, uh, earlier that a lot of times you guys are um, sort of suddenly you have this platform and everybody's asking your opinion about stuff. And um, and so you write a blog post and you feel good about it and you're kind of wondering, well, what's how do I know if I did a good job? You know, what's the measure of success here? And I think what would we appreciate it about what James did here was that um, it, you know, we, we focused on sort of making sure that he relied on his personal story. Um, he mentioned his, his role as a former teacher and his, his kind of personal feelings. Um, but he also kind of referring to a larger situation that's going on. And even at the end, he doesn't have kind of like the classic nut graph that we talked about, but he does kind of, point out that this is related to, um, you know, uh, you know, that this affects everybody. Um, and then I think what we found was that he got a lot of comments, um, a lot of chatter on, on, on Twitter, a lot of chatter on Facebook. Um, that kind of response is a really critical, um, measure of engagement that you're getting people and that's you know when you share an opinion that's strong that's going that's what you can get um and and similarly we got a lot of traffic for the post so we knew that it was taking off so i think that was an example i think you kind of not every post not every the page views isn't everything i guess is the point so um you can if you can get, get engender some conversation and and with your colleagues and with others out there um, I think you know you're you're hitting on something right. Um, and Joe, to answer your question, um, the uh, on our particular site, um, the uh, I'm not sure what, what what we do when if you submit a post to education post is we'll pick the what we call the pull quotes. Um, so those things that pop out, um, that's something that we do as a sort of an editorial decision as we're sort of loading the post. Um, we off, often will write the headlines too, um, and that's that kind of a common practice in, in sort of the publication world, which is you sort of the headline sort of appears at the end. Um, and and th I'd say occasionally we do post something, and then the author or someone close to the author comes back and says like, "Oh my God, change that headline!" And of course we do right away. 
Um, but generally, we try to do it in a way that respects what I was talking about earlier. Just we want to make sure each post gets just the absolute most traction that it can get. But we also want to make sure the the headline is honest, and uh, so we don't ever we try really hard not to put a headline on there that's going to be um, misleading or um, you know stretch what the person is actually saying. Um, let's see here. Yeah, that's great. The Michael had to post it really took off. And I think that's um, a similar feeling. You know, a lot of times when you're writing, it's hard to know when something is going to really, um, when something's really going to hit. And that's why, you know, you want to treat every post like it could be one that could resonate with somebody. And whether it gets that 25,000 views, who knows, but what it, um, but the people it hits will really, will resonate. Gordon, um, um, let me interrupt you for one minute, if you yeah. don't mind. Will you let me um, try to help with uh, um, recognizing a comment to raise? Just because I noticed that it's like 12 after, and I know you've got a lot of other good stuff. So I want you to feel free to get to that and know that I'll ping you if I see something that you really need to get on right away. Would that work? Yeah, sure. And so... Um, well, the next thing I wanted to actually kind of calm the comment thread because I want to, want to, I want to bring you guys in. Um, and uh, this is actually sort of the question period. If, if you had some questions about those, um, uh, the, the presentation up to now, then this is a great time to kind of make some clarifications. And then what we're going to do is uh, do a little exercise where um, one of your colleagues, Bill, has actually volunteered to to be the guinea pig here and have us look at one of his posts and talk about it. And that'll give us a chance to unpack a lot of these ideas and talk about, you know, how that relates to your own work. Um, so I think I'll just keep moving on. I don't see any questions coming in. Um, and uh, so here we've got another uh, exercise. Now Bill is a, is a math teacher in DC. Um, many of you may know him already. And I'm going to send you a Google Doc link that is a, a recent submission that he made. And, um, and he, he and Lori sent it over to Education Post. And I loved it immediately. And it felt like there were some things that we should work on before we moved it to publication. And then I was thinking about that as I was planning this talk and thought this would be great. Um, for for us all to work together on it, assuming he's comfortable. So I really appreciate this, Bill, and uh, and know that this is um, me putting you on the chopping block. Like this is only because I had so much respect for what you sent over um, that it'll be able to handle this kind of scrutiny. So um, let me. Um, so everybody, click on that link and go read Bill's piece. I'll give you a couple minutes. Give you one more minute to finish up.
Now, as you're wrapping up your reading, um, I'd love for you to enter into the chat um, and let us know what, what do you what do you like? What do you see that you like about this? Anything else you guys see that, that you, you like that, that pulls out sort of, you know, um, get you to read it? It's great. These are great. These are great. And so, um, as you're writing those in, now you can also chime in with any suggestions you have, any, anything, any, maybe room for improvement or things you want to see more of or less of. This is where we know Bill's skin is thick like leather. So these are some great suggestions coming in for Bill. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, I like how these, these critiques actually tie right really well to the things that you like as well. It's kind of like, I want to see more of it. Yeah, so um, Joe, Joe just teed me up. I actually had, a, I kind of hearkened back to the nut graph idea here. Um, and uh, some of you kind of hit on this idea too, that um, what's the larger purpose? And that was something I thought when I read it was kind of, um, you know, this is just such a, it, the, Bill pulls you right in. And you really, you start to see his students kind of come, you know, their faces start to emerge. And then, then suddenly the post is over. And it's kind of like, what's the larger point here? I just I felt like he was taking me somewhere kind of deep. Um, and I felt like it stopped a little soon. And so it made me think of this nut graph idea that, you know, you kind of just say, this is why this matters. You know, maybe this, you know, and you could take that in any number of directions. So do you guys have some ideas for Bill on, where could he take this? You know, I think some of you mentioned sort of expanding on the teacher appreciation week. Um, uh, but are there are some other kind of larger points, you know, like what, cause what could this blog actually be about, you know, that, that the, um, that in fact, the, the name tag exercise is really just an example of some larger thing that or some deeper thing. Is there anything you guys can mention? 
or suggest. Yeah, Monica mentions validating students. Oh, and validating teachers. Very interesting. One thing I just thought of because uh, I, I've read this a couple times now, but I just read it again. Um, and uh, so Whitney got all the good stuff from Michael, it turns out. But um, the, uh, you know, one thing I, I was thinking, Bill, too, is that you could do, um, thinking about trying to grab something sort of from the current news cycle, that always is very helpful. Um, there might be some sort of recent, issues around student self-esteem and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about um, social emotional learning measures as, you know, as the new education law kind of allows for possibly trying to track that. And, uh, you know, some states are actually starting to wrestle with that. Um, and so you don't need to go into some kind of detail about that, but you kind of seize on this larger issue of, um, of, of managing and attending to the self-esteem and, and of these students who might be one way to go. And I should point out too that, you know, sometimes you're writing a blog post and maybe if you were writing this for Edutopia or well, not Edutopia, but or we are teachers or, you know, there's some blog posts, blogs where I think the focus really is meant to be, um, on practice, like what's a tip you have for a teacher? What, what's something I can do tomorrow? I've got to do something in my class. And so obviously if that's, that's your audience, then, you know, then maybe you don't need to pull into some larger thing, but certainly from education post or education week, um, the goal is to sort of think of sort of a national, like kind of larger issue that we can move on to, um, that we can connect it to. Sorry. Now, did anybody have any headline suggestions for Bill, having read that? Obviously, that might change if he fleshes out a deeper theme, but I thought it could be kind of an interesting exercise to sit and think for a second as a group. We actually at Education Post love to do brainstorms um, for headlines and for hashtags. We'll all get in the conference room together or get on video together and just throw out ideas nonstop, and it can be really illuminating. Yeah, Nate is definitely a rock star. He's really figuring out this blogging thing. Um, how many headlines do we usually write for a typical post? Um, I'd say in the three to five range. Um, what often happens is we'll we'll bandy about a bunch of ideas and then several of the rejects will end up being great tweets. And so we'll use those when we are tweeting it out. Um, we usually write several tweets for each post. So that's a, that's kind of a handy trick to use.
so the um, uh, Whitney actually came through with a full on title here. Nice, nicely done, Whitney. Um, and I'm noticing the time. So we have a couple more minutes. And, and Joe, as he promised, which is just awesome, came back at me with, with uh, I think it was Michael's difficult question about trying to write for stuff and not getting in trouble with your district. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I actually find that um, a really challenging question and would love to know if others have advice. I think that a lot of the most um, well-known um, teacher bloggers we've mentioned in the chat already, uh, Jose Vilson and um, uh, Nate Bowling, uh, both bloggers who've really made a name for themselves and really had some huge viral posts. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that they're not too worried <laughs> about the overall uh, getting in trouble. Um, I'm sure they have to watch their words now and then I'm sure their posts that they don't write that they would write. Um, but they somehow have found the topics that they can hit on and really have a strong opinion. Um, they can share uh, anecdotes, even if they're kind of anonymizing the kids, they share very specific anecdotes about their school. Um, and that's really what draws people in. Um, so I think, uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, it's about finding that. Um, Joe, I think your chat only went to me. I think you should share that with the group, though. It's a really good uh, point. Um, I think that um, you could definitely, um, you know, try to find that that range of topics where you feel like you can opine freely. And I, I, I've seen many teachers who have been able to find that sweet spot. And then I think once you find it, one of the nice things about blogging is that you can kind of repeat yourself over and over again um, with just gathering new anecdotes each time. And then again, that really depending on the news cycle. So co constantly watching when, um, if, if people are talking about a new statistic or if people are talking about a, a recent comment in a, presidential debate or whatever it is and using those what we call news hooks to to tell the same story you've already told in a new light um, and don't feel like you're repeating yourself don't feel like every time you write a blog post like well I already wrote about um, race and identity so I can't write that again no I mean you can write a whole you can have a whole blog set up just to write about race and identity um, so you're remembering that if you, you pick your couple themes that you're really comfortable with that's actually a great way to build a following So I think we're coming to 8.30 and I want to make sure, did anybody have any other um, burning questions that they wanted answered before we um, uh, wrap up? I'd just like to let everybody know, remind you that um, we'll put this in the newsletter and also do an invitation to everybody, but I believe it's on June 10th. Um, Gordon is going to lead us through social media and how to maximize um, what we're writing um, and use it in social media. So he'll share with us some of his tips from that side. In the meantime, if there's something specific that you've got or a question about social media, if you want to shoot me an email about it, um, I could uh, talk with Gordon and we could be sure we have it uh, slated for some discussion. Um, I really want to thank you all for coming. This was just absolutely wonderful. Um, we had 22 people and um, really diving in and not just sitting back and that's just wonderful. So thank you all very much. And Gordon, thank you for such rich content. Um, now this is taped and I'll put it in our newsletter, um, a link to it, and it will also be on the NSTOI site. Um, if you go under the menu under webinars in the upper right hand corner, um, you'll be able to see it in a couple days. So thanks everybody and have a good evening. Thanks guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gordon. See ya, uh, Lori. Nice job tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everybody.